Welcome to MRTV's People in XR. This is the podcast that introduces you to the most exciting players in the industry. And here is your host, Sebastian Ong. In this episode of People in XR, it's my utmost pleasure to say hello to Ana Ribeiro, who is the game developer of Pixel Rip 1989. Hi, Ana, how are you doing? Hi, thanks for having me here. It is, I'm feeling it. <laughs> it is great. It is really my pleasure to have you here. It's so awesome to speak with you and to find all, out all about your incredible game and also more about you because that's what people in, in XR is about. I want to learn about the people in XR who are interesting and I want to learn what they do and I want to learn about their background. So, Anna, first of all, please tell us a bit more about your game, your VR game, which is called Pixel Ripped 1989 for those people who have not yet played it. So Pixel Rept is a trip back in the 80s, um, where basically you play games the way it used to be. At 1989, uh, you are actually in a class to play in a Game Boy device. And your goal is basically to complete that game you play in the game without being called by the teacher. Because if she sees you play three times, it's game over, she breaks everything. So it's kind of like inception of video games. That's kind of, I think, the best way to explain this uh, meta crazy experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is so interesting. It is like so meta. You are in virtual reality. You sit in this classroom and then actually in virtual reality, you would look onto this device, right? Onto this kind of Game Boy device and you play the actual game on this Game Boy device, right? Yeah, the game in the game is called Pixel Rip, and that game you play in there is like a 2D platform game that referenced uh, many classics from that era. Um, that's one episode of uh, five we're planning to release. So 1989 is the era of the Game Boy, the release year of Game Boy. So uh, we reference a lot of that experience. But 19, the next episodes, for example, 1970, 1978 would be Atari era. And you will be in a different situation to complete that game you play. So you're always going to have a problem in your life. Right now you're in a classroom in 1989 and you have to deal with the teacher. But in the 70s, you have a different problem to play this game. All and right. then in 1983, will be arcades. 1995, Super Nintendo era, Sega Genesis, 1999, the first wow. TV games. So each episode <laughs> will reference a different generation. So a different generation of video games and also your life is going to change and you will be having a different problem to play video games because that's a life of every game. I think, yeah. People can relate to that. Anyone who <laughs> plays games know that. Wow, it's yeah. It's always hard to just have fun. <laughs> wow. So, wow, I just take, I just uh, get so many information. Let's go one by a time. So, uh, first of all, now the first game is Pixel Rip 1989. And then, as you just said, there's going to be, this is only the first one of a series of games, right? Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So this is so 1989. Yeah, I was there in that area, <laughs> and, and I just like in the game, I was I was loving my Game Boy. So for all the people who love retro gaming, right? This is like a game to worship <laughs> because it really makes you feel like you are young again in that classroom and playing with that Game Boy game. Um, did you um, um, did you also play Game Boy? Yeah, I did, uh, but no, I didn't have my own Game Boy. Oh, no. <laughs> I wasn't the rich kid. <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right, um, yeah. I play a lot of uh, Tamagoshi, Snake, all those games at class. And okay. I used to be really bad at school, I guess. Considered <laughs> one of the like, bad students. Uh, I used to always be firing paper. And I jumped the walls of the school. Yeah, I, I wasn't... One of the easiest ones. But, that, but, <laughs> but that's, I think that's all right. You still made it, right? You still made it um, to this yeah, podcast. I, I think I'm a normal adult and nowadays, I guess. Yeah, of I course. Mario Bags and uh, this is Exactly. For all the, my fridge is in the back here. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So you can directly get some adult beverages. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so for all the people who are, who are just listening to the podcast right now who cannot see Anna, so she is sitting behind a refrigerator and also in the background. <laughs> You can see a Mario, yeah. which is actually her 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 backpack, and yeah, it looks it looks cool. And also, I like your headphones. It's like a pixel uh, ripped headphones, right? I put stickers on it. Ah, you put stickers on it. Oh yeah. I wish it was actually pixel ripped. 
Okay, yeah, amazing. we can see it. Great. <laughs> so, um, please, please tell us a bit more about uh, Pixel Ripped in terms of um, when did you have the idea for this game? When when did you have the, the idea? Okay, I'm making a VR game in which you play 1980s um, video games. So that that's back in 2014. Uh, I was actually graduating in, in England and a master's degree at the NFDS. It's a it's called the National Film and Television School, and they have they made they make four movies, and now they have a game course. So at the end of the course, you have a whole year. You do what. Anything you want, the project you want. So I had a DK1 at the time. I bought 2013. And since I got the heads, since I actually played VR this time, I was just trying to do something. Um, to any project in, in uni, I was just thinking about how can I do this in VR. I was so excited to work with. Uh, but at the, the final year, I finally had an idea that really fit with the, with the media. I didn't want to make something that couldn't, It could be done better without VR. When something was, you could just do that with VR. So when I had, um, I actually had a dream <laughs> that uh, I have some weird dreams. I have conscious dreams sometimes too, and I remember really clear. So I remember I was playing this game in the living room, and then the game was changing graphics, evolving, and every time the graphics was evolved, the whole living room was pixelating and evolving too. At the end, everything was realistic and merge it together in one world. And I woke up with that idea of, wow, I really I really want people to experience the way it was to play a game and see that game changing and evolving. Like like we saw in the 80s, that's never gonna happen again. Um, I remember like playing Mario, Sonic, and he was so excited. So, oh my God, I wanna see how this character is gonna look in the next console. So it started from the idea of, okay, cool. I want people to travel in time, play video games, be and see that game changing and evolving and experience this revolution of video games that we had. Wow. And it started from that. Incredible. <laughs> But it changed, it changed a lot. Like the boss battle now, uh, the characters explode from the console. And if you see, but that's like the ice in the cake moment. Yeah. And that wasn't, that wasn't a plan. Uh, it was, this was a bug that happened. Uh, at the beginning of the game, you'd be just playing a game in the TV. <laughs> But one day I forgot, when I tested first time, I forgot to tell, don't draw that character inside of the game in the world. And I saw this huge 2D pixel, pixel art character in the 3D world. And that that bug really changed uh, the, the the game. And that became the best moment of the game, the boss battle. And a lot of bugs uh, <laughs> got into the game. And a lot, lot of moments that I was basically having a view with friends and I just... And, oh my God, what if uh, you, like that moment that you are inside the game console, that just came, uh, just got in the game in like a year before, yeah, two years before the release. This whole game took four years. Wow. <laughs> so okay. Wow. Four years to develop. <laughs> yeah. So for you all of the, <laughs> yeah, good. For all of the people who have not yet played the game, you should absolutely play it. I loved it. I so loved it when I played it. And just what Anna said, like, um, you play the game first, and you 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 look on this little game gear kit, Game Boy like console, and then for the for the boss battles. The, the the game somehow comes out of that console and it's all around you and it's just like the way that yeah Anna has just described it in her dream that somehow your reality changes and everything is the video game and you play the video game around you in that virtual place and it's it's mind blowing I was totally mind blown when I played it and I think you've done an awesome job and I just want to tell you now that I got you here Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for making this game. It truly, truly, uh, yeah, it uh, made me very happy when I played it. <laughs> thanks for having me here. And uh, <laughs> also, I need to thank all, all the professionals that have been working with me since the beginning. Sure. At the beginning, I was a little bit alone. I have not many people with me. I had sound, the, some design, a composer that did the music and the pixel art since the beginning. And through the four years, <laughs> I had many uh, professionals that helped this project to really have this um, really good look of uh, something that before when I was alone, it was, uh, if you see the pixel art before, it's so funny. It's right. so bad. <laughs> um, right now, I, 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 I am the creative director and I finally have a team. So now, uh, uh, last year, actually, 
um, I got a lot of uh, ups and downs, we started the same. Of course. <laughs> Money comes and go, but um, last year I actually find a, a finally found a um, publisher here in Brazil. That's the reason why I gave back to Russia. Yeah, I was living out of Brazil since 2009. I moved, so I was in Europe, I was in England, I was in America. Uh, and I went to buy Silicon Valley for uh, Accelerator there. And then I got back to Brazil because of this publisher last year, because then finally now I have a team and uh, That's great. in the same environment. Uh, yeah, they give me support, not just uh, financial, but actually like the pro development with me. So finally I have some more people with me. So I want to thank them too uh, for, for how it came out. Like uh, it was really the last push I need. I'm not alone anymore. So okay. that's, that's a really good that, feeling to have. <laughs> that's Yeah, I believe it's it's tough to make, it, it would be very tough to make such a game alone. So you, but you started out completely alone. It was this university project when you were studying in, in England, right? It was the, the last year yeah. project. And then... Um, tell us, like, how many people are, <clears throat> are working on the game probably right now? Uh, right now, um, the, when the game was uh, at, when we got an Arbory and we got a team to actually do the last push, uh, I had freelancers around the world with me. So I had uh, the pixel artists with me since the beginning and the composer too. So the music, uh, it's really good. They actually got some awards and the pixel artists. Like, I'm really happy, and they have been four years now, and I had some friends in Brazil helping me out, uh, programmers, uh, but now with Avery, I have, uh, have all the, basically all the developers there. Uh, there are other projects, we have other projects, uh, all immersive, uh, all focusing on VR, yeah. so it's awesome to be there, and, but uh, work focus on Pixel Red, at the, we had at some point the whole team, so it was around like 10 people, 10 people. and then mm -hmm. at the yeah, it's like there's a uh, artist, concept artist, and posters, and had people do speak just particle effect. And um, at the end, when we're just making basic the QA, the last three months, uh, uh, we decided let's make the <laughs> team shorter because right now it's just fixing bugs. And, okay. And then the team got down to me, uh, the CTO, which is like a wizard, car mark guy that we have in Arbury. And uh, so it was me, Zed, and the, and the test. Uh, so Isaiah said, we're just fixing bugs. Isaiah was testing it, fixing bugs. It was just three people. Okay. And we worked a lot. It was like crazy <laughs> three months. Wow. Uh, but yeah, it, 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 it changed. So you don't, you don't want the whole team involved when you're just fixing bugs. Yeah, of course. It, is, it slows the process a lot too. <laughs> Wow. And like, I would like to know, so you started the whole thing uh, alone on your own. So um, w what is the most part that you are doing? Like you're doing the programming more or the, the art direction? What do you think is, uh, I mean, in the beginning, you did everything, right? You did the whole thing all by yourself, right? In the very, in the very beginning, <laughs> right? But then, but then you, the you, started, you started to look for some freelancers to help you with the graphics, with the design. So you, you got some, some help from outside. And, and yeah. now, now that you got the team, what is your role now in the team? Other than to be the so, boss. <laughs> it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to just uh, not do it. I really like uh, working in Unity and then, um, actually put my hands in the project. It's really hard to now uh, get it to the point that we, we're planning the next games, right? And uh, I've already said, okay, we're going to do the next games together. So uh, we have to decide it, what I'm going to be doing because now I have actually people to do everything. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's really hard to to actually give up that. So what uh, right. we decided makes sense. The thing I can't leave is to be the creative director and so the good the, the good decision we did is like so I, I really like programming. I like programming, I like getting unity and I like I like getting the scene and move things around. It's really for me that's when I actually get the ideas. It's the best way for me to brainstorm. Uh, instead of uh, I like penny paper. Like right now I'm doing some stuff in penny paper, but then when the moment when you put in unit, like actually when I get my ideas more clear, that's the moment that I actually do better creatively. <laughs> so we decided, okay, I can go in Unity and do everything um, like a prototype of stuff. And then I go to the team and say, okay, make this better. That's It's the best way we found so I can still work. Like I used to program and do stuff. But uh, I also a better way to show everyone the vision. So 
So especially in VR, because then I can go and view the scene and and make the game working there, like okay. an idea that I have. For. And imagine that I want to tell people, look, you're going to be playing a game in a Game Boy, and you're going to have fire in the teacher. And, and when you fire at the beam, footballers are going to jump through the window. It's, it's really hard sometimes to get people to see what you're looking at, why, why you imagine, and you can draw and do videos and, and do a whole documentation. But at the moment they put the headset and they see, it's easier to get it. So Got it. So the creative you... direction yeah. is the thing I have to, I yeah. have to keep it, but... And get people to make it better because I'm good. Uh, I'm not good in, and I'm not specialized in each in any specific area. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so but it's better that I know a little bit of all of it. Perfect. So, so you you really like to go into the code, make a nice prototype, and show your team the ideas, and then they can give it the polish, perhaps. Yeah. So cool. there there are special special 3D artists. There are specialized hardcore programmers mm. they can do like a most optimized version of my code and so every area there are, so the pixel artists the composer everyone can do uh, a better version of what i can do okay. so I'm, i can do the whole thing together and <laughs> and show the big picture nice. and uh, yeah that's why i should be <laughs> the director of this project and uh, that's what we decided Great. I think and I, I, there are so many like crazy ideas in this game, so many funny things where th sometimes I was just outright laughing, right? When the football players come in and then in some other in some other um, time, then you see some YouTubers, uh, not me, by the way. I hope in the next version there's uh, MRTV too. <laughs> and it's like really, really so interesting. Anyways, um, I was wondering now... Um, If people want to play this game, on which um, on which VR platforms is the game available? Is it available now for all the platforms? Uh, like it's on the major platforms, so it's on PlayStation VR, on America, and finally in Europe. <laughs> yes, it's on Oculus and Steam, okay. on Viport, on the Mixed Reality headset, so Microsoft Reality too. Okay, so um, if people want to play it, they will be able to play it. It's great, and I'm wondering. Yeah. Um, was it um, okay? You, you got the game, and then um, you needed to find a publisher to help you get this out, right? Because it's is it is it too tough to try just to put it yourself on Steam and and hope that it's going to take off? You need to find a publisher to make this happen. So uh, as an indie on Steam, and you can actually as a small uh, like alone, you can actually do it in, in your platform, but. It's a lot of work. <laughs> right. It, 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 it will, like, like I, I took four years doing this game. Um, <laughs> because I probably would take six years <laughs> if I didn't have find a um, right. it, 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 it It's a lot of bureaucracy, especially on PlayStation. Uh, on Oculus and Steam, after you release the game, uh, pretty much straightforward. You do change and you upload the, the like, every time you want to fix the bug. Now after the release, it takes like minutes. And it's there, and but on Sony we have to go through, <laughs> to send it, booking up. You have to book a slot, and it takes two, three days. And then when you can actually send the build and wait for them to authorize, if there's something wrong, the way to go back and forth. So until now we don't have basically the Halloween special we done. It's not a PlayStation yet because of uh, there's a lot of. Uh, steps we can have to go from there right um, it's right. good for i uh, we understand they want to keep the quality but for a small team it's, it's really complex so right it takes it's more possible, time but yeah especially the release process is long so our, our game was ready for release on two months before uh on oculus on steam just so you have an idea <laughs> and wow and then for sony we took like two or three months just doing wow. QA process. That is so crazy. So it was good to optimize the game. We had to remake <laughs> a lot of stuff. Uh, right now, the game, it, it runs much faster than every platform. And we are actually planning now the quest uh, to make a release launch for the quest. So the game is much more optimized than it used to be because Perfect. of PlayStation. 
Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Sony. <laughs> then, nice, <laughs> cool. Yeah, <laughs> probably now you're happy that they helped you with this quality control because now it's ready for the quest as well. <laughs> so, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering um, how how easy is it to find a publisher? And uh, I'm wondering in your shoes, how was it? Did you just apply for all the publishers in the world and say, hey, I'm Ana Ribeiro, I have this awesome game, check it out, please. Or how does it work? Did you send emails? Did you have connections already? Tell us a bit more, how did that process work out for you? I, uh, when I, when I was at, uh, I think the time I tried the most was during 2016, 2015, 2016. Yeah, 2016 was a year that money was all gone, and I was really looking for uh, support. And I I was um, at the Silicon Valley, so I could pitch for investors and look for uh, publishers for VR. At, at still nowadays a hard thing to find because the they're not they're not really looking for the the challenge and to take risks. So. Uh, and that's the thing as well. Like VR, the some publishers spoke and they're like, "Oh, we're not doing VR anymore. Try one game." So they like try one game, and that's you know, then I try two or three, <laughs> <laughs> and that's uh, that, that's kind of annoying. Uh, even if you have a good game, it was hard. Also, uh, sometimes you, uh, you found an investor or publisher, but that they doesn't have the they want to invest with money, but they don't have the vision. They don't respect the design. So I had, mm. there was some time, uh, this is early, this is like some time ago, but there was, I remember meeting with investors that they basically, uh, when they play the game, they're like, wow, so this game, you could charge people monthly. <laughs> and really? Wow. What if it was an RPG? <laughs> oh, no. And I, I was like, oh, great. Let's put like a sword in the teacher and I was an RPG. So like, it, it's, it's really hard not just to, uh, when you're looking for a publisher, you don't want just someone to give you that money. You want someone that also respects the vision and or understands it and actually believes in VR and it doesn't want to change the game now for, oh, it's not going to be VR, it's going to be an RPG. Let's try. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, it's really important also to, uh, uh, that's one thing I wear the most, like I always want to keep uh, the game as it is and the vision is the, uh, really believe in that. So when I found Arbery, actually we met at uh, 2016, there was a, the first uh, VR event in Brazil, and now every year it happens, it's called Hyper, and we met there. Uh, I was there with Pixel Ripped, and he had played the game, the CEO, Ricardo, he had played the game when it was Pixel Ripped, and back in 2014 when I released my student project. Uh, so it was... It was out there in 2014. You could download it for free at Oculus Share at the time. I don't know if you remember that. Then it was no store at the time, so everyone in the world could just go there for the apps. And right, I can remember. Yes, yes, exactly. So Pixel Rift uh, was there uh, for a few months in the first place, and I got a lot of press and a lot of YouTubers, and that's how I got uh, far for my student project. And at the time. And then Ricardo had played the game at that time. <laughs> he didn't even know it was made by Brazilian. And then we met at the event and and then he was like, oh my god, I love this game. And then he's all way to VR. And he, at the time he was moving from TV because uh, he's he works for TV uh, for a long time. And then we keep in touch. It was just like that. And then in 2000, last year, he announced that he was uh, opening a VR, a VR AR uh, basically, a, a company focusing just in most of experience and focusing VR, AR, mixed reality. So Great. I was like, get in touch with him, and was like, hey man, let's let's talk, and that and that's kind of how it happened. <laughs> so Perfect. It's of Facebook, <laughs> yeah, and so we met in an event. It, it you can never tell how how things course. are gonna work out. It, right. It's uh, unpredictable. <laughs> yes. So, but of course, it helps that you that you went to that convention in in Brazil. So it's good to to get out and make more connections. Basically. Yeah. Right? yeah definitely. Definitely. You no should question. Always, you should always be going to events and conference. That's where uh, that's where you meet the world. It's it's a small community, and usually when you go to an event, you can uh, make the the connections in person. It's never the same. Like you can, I meet a lot of people that I. I have connection on Facebook or of course. Twitter. Uh, but when you meet in person, it's different. 
Of course. If you're not, if you're not there, if you don't have presence, it, of course, it's really hard <laughs> to keep the connections, the boundaries. You know? Right. So, um, yeah, you just talked about you want to keep the vision for your game. So at the moment, um, how how I understand it, we we just played Pixel Ripped 1989, right? That was that was the the time of the Game Boy. And you also want to make four other games. And as I understood it now, you would like to do a game that was like in the 70s and you would want to do a game that is like uh, a bit later. Can you can you tell us a bit more about the games that are coming up? So actually at the end of 1989, there's a book there uh, hiding in the game that at the end when Cyberlord goes to get the pixel stone in a different year, Uh, players actually had the opportunity to choose their uh, the year, their favorite year. So exactly. Was in a yeah, I can remember. Yeah. And, and then there's a year at the top, and it's changed to the graphics of the air. Uh, right. But uh, that's basically we we get analytics there, we're trying to see what, what was the favorite choice for everyone else. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, <laughs> we can announce yet, but uh, okay, we, we actually have uh, a year decided. And oh wow! Be I, think, soon. <laughs> I think that's awesome. I can remember that because I played the game. I, I finished the game, and I think I, I if I I think I choose something like Super Nintendo. I believe something like it looked like a Metroid a bit. I think. Well, well, well. You for sure will find out very very soon. <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna be announcing uh, officially, but yeah, we're actually uh, now we're starting. Uh, Starting is the start of this new game. The plan is to release a pixel episode every year, not every four years. <laughs> oh, good, perfect. Uh, so we don't have to wait so long. And yeah, so it's, it's going so, to happen uh, in 2019. The next, the next uh, pixel ripped game. That's the plan. <laughs> okay, hopefully every, every year release an episode. Hopefully, yeah. Wow, that It's sounds that sounds very stressful. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like you, you're going to be very busy. <laughs> it is, it is, yeah, it, it is. It's gonna be busy, but I'm, I'm so excited to start a new game. And, yeah, of course. Uh, not have to do with black and white as a whole game before Yeah, of course. Uh, it's really tough to design and black and white. Yeah, you show uh, lava different from water and stuff like that. Simple thing. So I'm so excited to just have colors and work with that. Different eras of video games. Sure. Uh, different games. So I have been playing a lot of old school games again. Nice. As a reference. And Great. To remember how it used to be, you know, it's good to go back and play. Because we have... Of course. When you remember things, it's the nostalgia always gets you confused and remember in a different way. <laughs> It so always I'm, feels I'm feels better, right? You know what? You <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. you know what? What was really cool? I was playing your game, and I was actually streaming your game when I when I played it through, and I was so surprised that you were watching me play the game, and you were actually giving me <laughs> giving me some hints. Hey, yeah, this part is tough. You should play it like this, and I was so surprised that actually the developer of the game, you, were watching me play it, and I was thinking, wow. That is so incredible. And, and do you still do it? And tell us a bit, um, yeah. how, does it, how does it feel to, to see other people from all over the planet play your game? Yeah, that, that's definitely the best moment uh, for developers, just watching people play. That's why the reason you, we all make games and want to make a, oh, like you make a book or you write a book, you make a movie, that's, that's the the best thing, the best moment for you. Like when you actually see people uh, reacting somehow, make someone laugh or something that you can remember uh, because of a project you've done, you worked on it. So that definitely something that for me uh, that I have the most fun. Uh, even nowadays when I see popping up, if I am live and I see someone, there's someone streaming the game now, that's definitely something I stop everything to watch. <laughs> Um, it, 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 that's the cool thing about indie developers also like it, usually the big companies big corporations you don't get that attached so you don't see the developers of exactly. Skyrim coming in yeah. of Fallout <laughs> coming in like, hey we're playing game. <laughs> yeah you should totally <laughs> defeat the boss like this not like this <laughs> like you, yeah. you told me that was so funny <laughs> it's quite meta right it's, if you think about it imagine in the past you were playing the game and it 
if you if you're stuck in a place you'd have to get a magazine and find it and talk to your friends imagine the developer would just pop up and say hey by the way just do this <laughs> It was really, it was an unbelievable moment. It was so, it really matters. So I was playing a game in a virtual reality game and I cannot uh, proceed. And then the developer comes and tells me, yeah, look at this. You have to be more in the middle here. It's like, what? It was like, the, the, the moment was so unbelievable. It's amazing. It's hard to do it spoil people that. Yes, yeah. I, I hope I did this for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like really incredible what our technology can do right now, and it's it's so fun to live in that in that world right now where we can do something like this. So you're still doing it. You're still popping into some people's Twitch stream. Hey, I'm I'm the <laughs> <Yes>. developer. <laughs> that is incredible. That is awesome. I, I, I even these moments. I like when I like people like uh one person watching and uh, I'm like hey. Yeah, my um, stream was like this, like six game. people watching. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's just me watching. It, it, it is, is crazy. It's it, the, really? The development? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really cool. Uh, and yeah, that, that, that's something we, we are thankful for people playing the game. So that don't feel like, I feel the same way as the same way that people are thankful for me watching. I'm, I'm more than thankful to be watching someone playing a game. So. Of course. It's, 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 it's Especially it's after you, cool. after you have spent the last, <laughs> after you spent the last four years on the game, probably every single day, then then to see people really enjoying it, yeah, I, I I understand it. I can understand that this must be an awesome feeling, and uh, yeah. So to all the people who are going to play the game, please um, stream it to Twitch. Yeah, probably Anna is going to stop by and tell <laughs> you how to defeat this last boss, which is kind of hard, I must say. <laughs> Yeah, we, we we did some change. When did you play it, at boss? Uh, I, I think there was a, it was like a couple of months <laughs> when you had just released it. Then then I played it. It was tough. Yeah, it, it was super hard. Uh, <laughs> we did some. Uh, there, there's some things that people could do that it wasn't clear enough. Like you could actually fire with these people on those um, rotating fireballs uh, platforms. It was really tough. You could do didn't destroy them before right that's and, you told me that and then afterwards i could like win <laughs> yeah we, we we made it a little bit less uh, uh hard <laughs> it's okay. too hard nowadays yeah but it's, it's uh, good that it's hard but gonna, yeah it's actually I, I like it that it's hard right it should be not too easy but some parts yeah. were just very hard it, it, uh, next games you want to accept that uh that you can choose hard Easy normal. All right. Um, we have a hardcore normal, hardcore old school mode <laughs> because <laughs> um, our main audience are uh, people that really, really love the game. Uh, are the ones that actually won hard games and they right. they want to remember how it used to be playing old school games that you you go back and play again and have that feeling that you're like squeezing the controller and <laughs> exactly. So, Having that moment of like, that's it, I'm gonna do it right now. And then when you've made it after <laughs> you're struggling, you feel they have that feeling of achievement. And you can't have Absolutely. that feeling. The game's too Absolutely. easy and it's holding your hand all the time. Um, and if the game's about school gaming, you can, can't make it too easy. No, uh, I totally but agree. we wanna give people their choice, right? If you're not a hardcore gamer, you wanna just chill, you can just choose easy. Right. And if you wanna have the true experience from the old school game in Django Hardcore. Perfect. Yeah, it's it's really <laughs> just like you said, that feeling of achievement was amazing when I when I was beating the game and then I can choose which area I loved. That's great. And you know what I was also thinking like there's so many um, possibilities to do some merchandising. Did you think about that? You can uh, you can sell probably this uh, this gear kit some version of it with some retro games or so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or this exactly, this merchandise, it's it's like the the, 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 the the colors, it's it's just so nice. Are you are you working on, on, on yeah. having more? Oh nice, yeah. Yeah, stickers, exactly, perfect. Where where can we get these where can we get this merchandising stuff? Uh, we are still working on it. Actually right now there's nothing uh, uh, official uh, okay. like we, we just bring it for events uh, to church and uh, give to some people like but not, not like officially a store where you can buy it and, but we are working on it some people have been asking also for uh, old school like uh, actually physical version of the game they can buy it and have their exactly. retro experience 
It would, it would um, be so cool yeah, if you could if you could sell some this little Game Boy with really the pixel ripped game in it. That would be unbelievable. Yeah. That would be so that cool. That was always on my plans to do that at some point. I have the game yeah, <laughs> in right. the Game Boy. Uh, or maybe it's just in your phone. You know, like exactly. That would be good game. enough. Exactly. That would be great. Yeah. And it's, a, it's, it's so separate nowadays. Like that game, it, it's separate from the other game. So in Unity, we have scenes separated for the game in the Game Boy. So we could easily uh, make a build just for a mobile. That game separate. Perfect. Yes, yeah, so it's, uh, it's really it, two it's games. It's not a plan, but it's a lot. It's a lot of things to do, and we have to focus in what is the most important thing. Because uh, um, uh, the 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 team right now we are we're startups. So Avery, the publisher, we are building, we're growing now. Uh, actually, the the company is now growing, doubling the amount of people. It's, we used to be twenty, now it's going to be forty people. Um, so maybe in the next episodes we do. Uh, like the plan is to do like physical copies in the next games and uh, release on the stores and have like more things going on. Like actually have a store sell merchandising for pixel ray things that people have been asking for a long time. Finally, gonna be able to organize when the company grow. And yeah, that's <laughs> that would be awesome. I would that's I would so, love I, to I get this physical have, copy. That would be yeah, amazing. Me, me too. Like, yeah, I, I, would, I think I would just cry and fall over <laughs> the floor like a crazy person. If I'm working like <laughs> and I see a game shop with my game in it physically, I would just I think I would just get the game and scream, ah, Yeah, of course. Yeah, I made it, yes. And run around, run around in the mall <laughs> with the game in my hand. Ah. Oh my goodness, that would be so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um I, I'm wondering, I think it'll be I, I'm wondering, um, in in Brazil, tell us a bit about the the scene in Brazil. Is is VR getting bigger there? I, I can remember. I I I learned something about Brazil. Like you still like the old consoles. Tell us a bit more about um, how the gaming scene in Brazil. So yeah, for VR specifically, it it's still pretty much um, arcades are. Uh, definitely the bigger market right now because uh, the VR headsets here is uh, actually anything that comes from outside the country it's like three times the price, two times the price for wow. PlayStation here. It's crazy. Uh, VR headset that like Oculus actually didn't officially release here, so you always have to buy people to sell it and sell it. And it's just rich people can basically have a headset now it's wow. it's <laughs> this is more um so they uh, so just you have an idea like our game uh, here it's like one percent of the market is too it's uh pretty small uh and we have a lot of audience we have a lot of people that love the game but they just don't have a headset um at Arvory we we now have a actually an arcade and it's, it's in the it's in one of the it, it's looks so cool it's like a throne arcade if we had there was a competition about the VR, the arcade the arcades in the world that look the best and i think we could be a big winner it's just great it's like it's growing now it's going to other balls uh but we have there like big rip and also big saber even like the green with the green background that you could just be inside the game we have called vr like all the major vr games are there uh, Creed, uh, Space Pirate Training. Um, so it is, a, it is, there is a lot of market there. It's always full of people who go, a lot of kids too, and a lot of, it's always busy and it's one of the biggest walls here. It's um, the biggest arcade in probably South America for VR. Wow, so that sounds cool. Have, and yeah, it's, it's, full. it's growing to go and going to other malls and now, but. Uh, definitely the market in Brazil and South America is pretty much for arcades like having experience in uh, the games with the markets outside Brazil. Uh, and how, how expensive is it to go to, to, the, to the mall, uh, to the arcade and, and play like for one hour the, the VR games? So it's, it's like 40 reais for so in dollars, uh, let's say like 10, 10 dollars for 30 minutes. Um, around twenty dollars for one hour. Twenty dollars for one hour. But it's still expensive, right? For for Brazil. Right? Um comparing to the cinemas, actually it's the price here because like yesterday I went to the cinema and I pay hundred reais. Wow. To take it. 
<laughs> it's, it's actually a really good price uh, for the experience you can have. Okay. It's not, not that bad. And which movie it's did really you watch then? <laughs> um, so I went to watch the new uh, Harry Potter. Uh, oh, okay. But, uh, I wanted to see Queen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. I like Harry Potter a lot. But, <laughs> but this, uh, this one is not, was supposed really not to be so good, right? Um, I... I I'm, I was a little bit disappointed with the story. It okay. keeps changing. Yeah, like yeah. that's what I heard. Lots it. of different plots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I like the Dumbledore and yeah, um, of course. showing Hogwarts a little bit more. And yeah. yeah, but I was looking forward to watch Queen. And, uh, okay. <laughs> Another time. <laughs> Good. So um, I'm wondering, so so people go to arcades to play VR, but what do people have at home? Do they have the PlayStation 4 at home or do they still play PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3? How is it in Brazil? Um, here, uh, the, the gaming market is pretty big. Actually, yeah. people have a lot of Xbox. Too. Oh, Xbox really? Xbox Okay. Pretty big uh, compared to PlayStation um, but uh, yeah, PlayStation definitely they're going to VR now, so they definitely they wasn't have PlayStation because um, to go to, to the PC version it's just too really expensive to right. get a powerful computer. Exactly. And Oculus is not even release here or Vive or it. Yeah, definitely PlayStation. Like people do have some people I know they still have PlayStation Three or yeah. Xbox Xbox Three Hundred Sixty, but actually we are. Yeah, we're we're not that that retro. <laughs> yeah, most uh, there, there's a, sadly there's a still a lot of uh, piracy here. Um, okay. Yes. Like, but uh, it's it's going down a lot. Like it used to be bigger, and now it's going down finally. Okay. And, but the, here, I, I think in the past, like Mega Drive, uh, Sega Genesis, big here. Oh, yeah, I actually had one had uh, one Mega Drive here that was never really seven you other place. <laughs> oh really? Brazil. Cool. Yeah, yeah it's a big a, market. Yeah, Sega is pretty big here. We didn't have that doubt about what is better. It, mm. it was it was clear that everyone was Mega Drive. Wow. Uh, we actually had a console here in the past uh, in the eighties that just just released it here. It was called the Phantom System. Wow. And this is before Nintendo was here. Nintendo oh, really? wasn't even here. So we we grow up saying this is the best forever. Okay. Of course, because you, you could play Nintendo games uh, <laughs> with a Mega with a Sega Genesis control. <laughs> okay, cool, nice. Um, uh, yeah, Phantom System it was. I, I I still say now the best console I had mm -hmm. and the most different. It was just really simple. It was a crazy thing. <laughs> it's really playing nice, Nintendo interesting games to know. And Sega games. Right. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, so there's lots of things going on in Brazil, which is nice. But, yeah, for the VR, I understand it's still very expensive. So probably the PSVR might be the first console that might work there with, with VR, bringing it to the masses, even though it's still also a bit expensive. Anyways. Yeah, because most people have the console. So okay. most people have the PlayStation, they would just go by the headset. Right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, okay. So now we've talked quite a lot about uh, your game, which... Again, it's awesome. So everybody should definitely get it, Pixel Ripped. And now we would like to, I would like to talk a bit more about you, about you, Ana Ribeiro, the person. So um, tell, tell us a bit more about your, your video game career. You were always a gamer? Yeah, um, actually, I was lucky to have... I'm lucky. <laughs> I was lucky. I don't have... I'm not anymore. <laughs> I am lucky to have three brothers, uh, and I... Because in the 80s, it would be hard, uh, it would be really rare if parents buy video games for the girls. Uh, unfortunately, the marketing was pretty much for boys, the commercials, and you would never think, oh, I'm going to buy video games for my daughter. Uh, so I'm really lucky to grow up in that family with brothers. Since I remember to be a person, <laughs> there was video games in the house and it was always part of uh, our lives. Uh, first console we had... It was actually the Odyssey 2. And right. we had also a Pong console. Oh, wow. Uh, it was one of the Pong consoles. <laughs> amazing. That's this amazing. 19... That's really like I, I, old school, I'm super old school. So this is 1983 when I bought it. So, um, okay, Pixel Rip 1983 is just going to be Pong. 
<laughs> and in here, uh, I'm from the countryside of you, so it's like not the biggest uh, town place. Like right now, I'm living in São Paulo, but I grew up in the north, uh, where's the countryside area of Brazil. Uh, and basically, the video games here and the movies, everything was coming really late. So I, my my childhood is kind of more like a 70s than 80s. It feels more like that for me when I remember. Okay, cool. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy for that because I could experience so many old cool uh, games and like have a phone console and awesome. I just see too. Um, but yeah, it, video games have been part of uh, my childhood and best friends I've done also was playing video games. I had a, a Counter-Strike female team at some point. Cool. And we did, but this is, uh, this is Counter-Strike 1.6 uh, when uh, there wasn't, it was the start of, I remember the first time I made my Steam account it was at that period and it wasn't like a, prof- we, we call ourselves professionals but we didn't have a salary like nowadays and yeah, uh, it wasn't a career. We would like get a shirt, and they would pay competitions to go, and wouldn't we wouldn't pay to play games on the on the cyber cafe. That that's the that was it. Got it. And at what time? At what time did you did you think about making this whole love for video games a career? When did you think like you know what? I am going to become a game developer. Was it at high school, or at what time did you think you know what? I'm going to make it happen. Um, I got a long time to figure out that I ended up going through like a traditional um, career. And I was like, I, I started psychology for five years. Um, and then I ended up uh, passing, uh, it's called Confuso here. It's like when you work for the government, it's considered one of the best jobs you can get. You have to start for like over a year, do a series of exams, and everyone's trying to get this place in the government. And then I got it uh, to work at the Justice Council. And I worked there for over five years, basically typing documents for the judge, um, like divorces and super bureaucratic uh, job. Sounds boring. And then... Yeah, so for me it was a prison. Uh, I like creating, you know, like I like doing new things. And I couldn't change anything there. I couldn't create anything. I would extend my time having fun. For me, it was the best moment. It was like when we changed the stickers in the box uh, after the document. And I was like, yeah, I can do that. I can change, and I can make something different. <laughs> this is so sad. Uh, for me, it was. I felt like a fish outside. Of just what I'm doing here. <laughs> and um, I, I, I think it from trying to escape from that place, I started cooking pies <laughs> for my friends, and they, they asked me to bring it more. And then suddenly, I, uh, and then uh, quickly, I realized I was actually selling pies at work. And weirdly, in six months, I had a mini small business of pies. And that's incredible. Was like, I was selling pies in this whole building in the neighborhood, and I. I got like in six months. I had to contract people to help me, and <laughs> wow. I had this. I was like a small business director kind of, and then I had um, sellers. I had people working. I had like four thousand pies a month. I was selling. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> it, it it was out of the blue, and then I I did a course for prepare to open the business and uh, actually to make a pie shop, and I was starting to build this pie shop at uh, near the lake in my hometown where it's like a good place for business. And I did a course for startups and this was like a week course. And in that course, I finally realized I was in the wrong direction in my life. <laughs> no more pies so and no more government <laughs> job. You want to make video games. Yeah, this is 2009. It's long, okay. It took a long time to figure out, but I was, I'm happy that I finally did it because it's hard. It's really it must be frustrating that you spend your whole life and then you realize, oh, what if? And I hate saying what if. And I, I'm glad that I took the risk and I did that because uh, my life is something else now, totally different. It's like I feel like I'm born again. How amazing! And I'm having this new chance. How amazing! <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness! So you so went from, 
you went from a completely bureaucratic, boring job where you just have to type some boring divorce papers to becoming an entrepreneur who sells pies to all of the to all of the area where you live, and then you thought, you know what, I make video games. <laughs> yeah, I. That is I, unbelievable. I, I, that is incredible. I actually did a TED talk. I have been doing a TED talk about it. Uh, this question that was put it to us on this uh, startup course. And this is the question that actually changed my life. Is the, the way they put it, it really helped me to see clear what I want, and what I like in myself. Because before I didn't have this, I didn't give me the space to pick what Anna wants. And I was always just going through the life. And we just go through life and it's, okay, now I have to do this course. Now I have to <laughs> work in this place. And then when you realize what I'm doing here, so it was, it, the question was like this, basically it was, Uh, forget about your, your your work, your 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 business, and and they you said to everyone, forget about your family, your your life that you have now. Of course, you don't imagine that you born to stay here, that you don't have any past, and you can start a new life now. What do you want to do in five years, in ten years? <laughs> and I was just like, oh my god. <laughs> I don't want to be baking pies. <laughs> <laughs> no pies. It was so good to just think fresh, you know, just have this opportunity to think fresh. I think we should, we should all try to do this question every day. It's really, really good. Just try to imagine uh, if your life started now, what could you do? Because uh, we just have one life. And if we, if we don't every day replan it and imagine it, we don't have, we not, never have a chance to actually do something. Uh, that we want. So, uh, yeah, that really helped me. I started from zero. I didn't have any knowledge for making. I just played games, but I didn't have any programming or even Photoshop I never had to use it for. So, um, it was a start of a new life. I moved from Brazil and I went to England. So, I actually had a new country, a new language I was talking, a new career. It was a fresh start. Um, I was, I was thinking, you know what? If everything goes wrong, I can come back and make pies. So I should try. <laughs> you can always go back to pies. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So um, it all happened in that startup course when you had this question asked. And yeah, I think the, the exciting thing is that you really made the decision. Yes, now I want to make games without even having any kind of contact with the technical side, like how to program a game. Like, um, um, when, when, when you were sure for yourself, yes, I want to become now a game developer, what was your first step to learn how to make games? What did you do? Hi, I went to Google and I searched for game courses in, in London, in England. I really want to, I was thinking, you know, if I'm going to start from scratch, why not start from a place that I always want, I always wanted to live in Europe. <laughs> so... I I thought, you know what, I'm going to start a new life. Why not try in a new place too? I could have had come to Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo had courses at the time. But I basically went to Google and I searched, hey, I want to live in England and I'll <laughs> search for game course. I didn't have any idea of any Unity and any engine that you could use. Uh, so I had a holiday for my work uh, that I could still go in a holiday and still have my service. So I got that uh, break and went to England and stayed there for, I actually had like, after five years of work there, you had these um, three months of holiday you could take. Okay, so cool. I took that as like, a, a, that's my chance. I have, <laughs> when I use these three months, as I use these three months to get my holiday, I have four months that I had my salary and I went to England. And I went to the university that I saw on Google, an SAE university. And I went there. I met the university. I did the English course because when you go uh, for a student visa, you need to have an IELTS. Or just like uh, immigrants know about that. <laughs> you have to do an English exam. It's pretty hard. And you have to have a minimum um, English uh Uh, certification. So I did this course preparing for that so I could actually uh, uh, enter the course. So you have to do all that before. And I love England and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm decided I'm going to move here. So actually I did I did a great decision, but I actually planned it. 
<laughs> they nice. went all crazy. I went back to Brazil. I sold my car and I left my job officially. And I got back there and I start, started studying uh, games programming course, which was uh, one year on that course. It was basically, um, I was like teaching in programmers to create game engines. So it's a pretty hardcore course, the first one I did. And it was basically, we were learning how to build Unity. What? <laughs> Oh my C++ goodness! Plus, From C++ zero, plus you, you, you couldn't, you, you don't know any coding before. <laughs> no, and wow. I thought, okay, that's how you make games. I thought that's how you make games. I didn't thought that, that that's hard. I thought that's how it is. Okay, <laughs> it was hardcore. It was C plus plus, and was building everything from scratch. You had to program the camera. And it it was. I, I'm glad that this was my first course because. After that, when I when I learned Unity, I was so happy. I was like, how easy everything is! Yeah. <laughs> it's like you. It's like when you learn how to drive. They say you should learn in a really hard car. So and so when you get like a easier car, you just find it super easy. So I felt like that. <laughs> wow. Yeah, of course. Uh, so basically, when I did the, I, yeah. Go sorry. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So yeah, I, was, I did one year of games programming at SAE University, and then. Uh, my course coordinator helped me to go for the master's degree at the NFDS, uh, which was more like a game design, more like a game director course. There you you learn Unity and you learn all this other stuff. And this course, I was learning basically how to program, be a hardcore programmer. But I'm more like a designer. And my course coordinator, he realized that and he helped me to get to NFDS. And uh, yeah, with the psychology degree I had. It actually really helped me to go to a master's degree in games because they're looking for uh, people with different backgrounds. And of course, there was a philosopher, an architecture, so a writer. And when I, I had all this background, and I'm a psychologist and I had this my business, they really liked it. And, and NFTS actually is pretty hard to get a place there. It was just eight, they have eight students a year there. Eight. And, uh, eight students. And every course, there's, uh, the composer course at the time, there was four composers. It was pretty hard to get in there. And I'm so glad I did because uh, I think Pixar has a lot of that I learned from there because at the NFTS was basically working with people that are making movies. So I could work with uh, students that were uh, never working games and they just came from the film industry. And they're more mature. So it was like people with over 25 uh, around. To 25, 40 years old there. So it was really good. It was basically a course that you could just do projects and you could get your hands on projects and, and have to direct other, uh, uh, other expertise uh, professionals. So for me, it was a really important course because it was the first time I could, I could work with a sound designer, composer, writer. Uh, actually, the trailer that we have on Pixel Ripped was recorded there. Um, uh, it's, it was for me the the what well, made me a director, teach me to be a director. Wow! Uh, the wow. retro trailer we did that there's a part that you are you see a kid um, playing in a in a he's playing a video game in the living room and his mom arrives and it has this feeling of oh that's an old school 80s commercial. Uh, that part was all recorded there at NSTS and basically I met these directors and. Uh, TV directors and cinematographers in the bar and the universe. So that was good, crazy, cool thing about this place. You could just go have a pint at the bar and talk to a cinematographer and a TV director. Hey, I have this idea of making an 80s TV commercial. Would you like to do it? Yeah, let's do it. And oh, that's, that's how it happened there. Nice. Um, and the composer I met there too. And, Mm -hmm. so, you, so, so for everybody who wants to make a video game, go to the bar and get some pints. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I think if you, uh, when you were really into a project, you ended up thinking all the time about the project. So great, um, most of the best part of the game actually happened when you're having a pint. Right, right. Killing I out and you. <laughs> cool, it's perfect. Uh, nice. Um, Wow, that's so interesting to know. Um, I'm wondering if you, if you could give one piece of advice to people who also want to become a game developer, who want to stop their life 
making pies, who want to stop their careers um, doing some legal advice, but who want to make the next <laughs> VR game, what would you want them to do? Should they also make a course about how to make Unity <laughs> or should they go for something else? Uh, I think uh, people should uh, first uh, realize what area they like the most because video games is such a huge uh, you can go to so many different areas to work in that industry. Uh, and I would say, if you don't know where which area you like yet the most, uh, download Unity and start prototyping. Start like try to make a game like uh, don't try to make a super hardcore RPG. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's too hard. But yes. start watching tutorials nowadays. You can go online. There's so many tutorials of uh, Unity, and you can. Try to make a game. Like try a little bit of all the areas. A simple game, prototype. And then I, when you do that, you, it's going to be easier for you to realize the parts you like the most. Do I like to actually, I'm going to make a game, for example, it's doing pixel work. Uh, when I was building, I could, I've, if I found like a, a model, a 3D model ready, someone did the model, and here you go, it's ready. I'll be so happy. Yes, the 3D model is ready. But if I find, I, I didn't want, I, I, I knew how to, I know how to model, but I, it wasn't the thing I would enjoy the most because I realized that when I could just go on the asset store and find the thing ready, I would be super excited. But if I find the game ready, like uh, you can find download, you can download nowadays, like for example, zombie shooter mm -hmm. uh, code ready to use. Uh, some part of the code ready, I'll be so sad. I'll be like, oh, I want to build it. And I, I I felt like when I like the 3D artist uh, step, she was really sad when we find something ready because she wants to do it because she loved she loved 3D modeling she loved doing that and you can definitely see the areas you like the most are the ones you want to do yourself and you want to be involved and the ones that you're happy to have it done and ready like I, I like to have someone doing the sound someone doing the music. Got it. Um, and I think you should go for it with a prototype and then you're going to definitely realize, am I a programmer? Am I a designer? Am I more a 3D artist or a 2D artist uh, or sound designer or composer? That's how many areas. Right. And then from there, you should, I, I like, you can, some people teach themselves. I am, I am more like a person I love. Uh, I like it. I really enjoy the time I spend in university, actually doing, uh, meeting people, other mm -hmm. developers and, Wow. Have, but to some people, they may just, I want to just teach myself, it's fine. Sure. As long as you discover there and then you apply for a course where you actually teach yourself. Cool. So uh, that's a great piece of advice. People should first, yeah, tr try it out and find what exactly they like about game development because there's so many different parts about game development yeah. and you first have to find out what you really like. Great. And um, now we're getting closer to the one hour range already, but I still would like to ask you some questions about, yeah, the VR industry, right? The industry that we are in. I would like to ask you, how do, how do you feel about the industry right now in the end of 2018? Where are we with it? So uh, I, I have been long time now, long time, I mean, yeah. from the beginning, since 2014. Now it right. seems like far away. <laughs> yes. so it happened so many times since 2013, 14, that it feels like a long time because of the evolution of VR and all the headsets they came out. Uh, yeah, I believe that with the Quest now, we are, with the release of the Quest and all the other headsets are going to be coming uh, with no need of cameras and no need of uh, extra hardware, you know powerful computer to go to VR. All these steps that we're going to jump through. I really believe that VR is going to be uh, becoming mainstream uh, next year and from next year so far uh, after that because now finally we have a headset uh, the way we plan it long time. Now we're ready to use and uh, uh, now right now what it's making so hard to people to go into VR is the price and the other steps you have to go so without that and a good price and a headset that people can just put in their heads and ready to go, um, I believe we're really, really going to open up the market much more. I'm super excited for this. Um, finally, we are at the moment that we ex waited so long you know, for this, for the marketing is more mature, the development 
uh, the headset so they're going to become mature. Cool. So that's what nice. we need. It. Okay, so yeah, the Quest. Very exciting. I agree with you. So that I think lots of people will get into VR. They'll be able to play Pixel Ripped and Beat Saber and all these games, and they don't need to get the high the gaming PC and so on and so forth. But do you think that this will be sold in Brazil, or do you think you have to import it as well? Uh, right now, there is no plan to release here. I hope I hope they they plan to release here. Uh, right now, we don't have. Anything from Oculus they officially announced it. Okay. So I hope they, they really <laughs> change that and release here because I believe this headset's really going to change um, the world. They should, I hope they should try this time to release worldwide because uh, uh, that's the headset that I, I believe here would work so well. Right. And right. from all the headsets that we have so far, um, there's, there's, there's a complaint in that. Not just in Brazil, but everywhere you hear people that they are deciding to go for VR and buy a VR headset. They're super excited. They really wouldn't have one. And then when you go and tell them you have to buy a computer and then you have to do all that, they're like, oh, oh no, I don't have a computer. Right. So, oh, right. So I don't it, have a headset. It's 400. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really just, expensive. Got it. Um, so we have so to I now we have to now to tell Mark Zuckerberg, dear Mark Zuckerberg, if you're watching or listening to the People in XR podcast, right, and you should do that, please um, also publish and launch the Oculus Quest in Brazil, right, Anna? Yeah, <laughs> we need you need you need to be in the stores. You need to be yes. like I go in America, and I'm it's so good to just go in the store and the Best Buy or whatever and see headsets. Here you don't have that. You you. you you go in the stores and don't see any headset. Yeah, it's just <laughs> it's, uh, it, it is really hard to achieve the public like this. Uh, you just get like people that are really into tech and then know or they travel a lot and they can buy when they travel or super rich and they can go and buy second hand or, or online for people that go <laughs> buy and they sell it. And it's just crazy. You spend a thousand dollars in a headset here. It's yeah, just, that's that's unbelievable. It's a lot of money, and yeah. plus you have you need to own a really expensive laptop or computer. Uh, and it's just too <laughs> my, much. my laptop. Uh, I, I bought for, five, for around five thousand reais, and here in Brazil it was going to be ten thousand. Oh my god! Oh my goodness! Twice the price. Yes. So any laptop, you say, "Oh, we are ready laptop." Imagine the twice of that price, which is already expensive. Plus the headset, it's twice or three times the price. Oh my god! Uh, that's Really it's too bad. It's really hard. Uh, right. It's quite much how hard is VR nowadays for South America. Oh my goodness. Crazy. Yeah. Good. So your take on the industry next year is going to be a big year because of the Oculus Quest. And uh, yeah, I, I really hope it's going to happen. That would be so good. Now, at the, end yeah. of, at the end of our interview, I would like to ask you, so you have already, I think you've really achieved something huge with making that game and having it on all the platforms. It is amazing. So I would like to ask you, have you now already reached your personal biggest goal with, with that? And, uh, or do you have now the next goal already? Like, okay, this goal finished, now next goal. Tell us a bit more how you feel about having reached this incredible goal. Um, I, um, I believe that even the journey of getting here, it was uh, it worth it already for me. Uh, everything that I done since 2009 since I started making to since I started to study and going through the industry of uh, the game industry it's worth it so far like I I traveled so many places I've met so many people and learned I have been learning a lot and and this this whole journey has worth it definitely I would go back and do the same thing even if the outcome would be like oh the game was uh, didn't do well. Uh, um, I'm I'm super excited for everything that I've done so far. Just for now, I want to keep working. My plan is to keep working in VR, in VR, uh, making games. That's that's definitely something I want to keep working on. It. I want to uh, finish the franchise, uh, fix one of the episodes. Four more games. One of the plans. Uh, this is, was one game of the five episodes. So the plan is to finish. Uh, the series of big scripts and continue working with the VR games. Uh, that's definitely a plan I have 
uh, uh, to keep working on our um, revivalist project. So we're planning to keep working together after Fix Rift. So that's the plan right now. Uh, definitely, I want to somehow uh, create games that experience that can definitely help VR in the AR or to, to grow. go out there. You know, I think we need we need more good games, good experience uh, to actually make this industry uh, get mainstream, Got bigger it. and bigger, and get get people that are playing uh, the games like great. That's that's just what I wanted to keep doing. Just and I think that is fantastic. I keep working. Nice. Yeah. Anna, that's amazing. And you know what? I can't wait to play the next Pixel Rip games and to play your future games. And hopefully, also in the future, you will sometimes drop by my Twitch stream when I play your game and you can tell <laughs> me how to, how to beat it. Anna, thank you so much for being on the People in XR podcast. It has been amazing. I loved to speak with you. And for all of the people who have not yet played Pixel Ripped 1989, please, please play this game. It rocks. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me here. It was uh, great to talk to you. Um, I'm looking forward when you play the game again on the next games. I will definitely do that. <laughs> Thank you. Be Thank there. You. I'm here. I do that. <laughs> uh, I spoil everyone. I'm exactly. sorry. I, I'm not going to spoil next time. <laughs> okay. But yeah, thanks for having me here. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that's it for this episode of People in XR. If you made it this far, then probably you like the show. So why don't you leave a review at your favorite podcast provider so more people can find the show or directly share it with your fellow VR enthusiasts. My name is Sebastian Ahn and I'm looking forward to meet you in the next episode. <laughs>